Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm so honored to be here uh, in Bioneers. It's so wonderful to be among people where it's popular to think and do something that's so important today for what we're doing. Um, I want to give you a little bit of history about who we are, uh, the land you're sitting on, and how that will ultimately tie into, I've got some news, breaking news for you the, that you'll be the first to hear uh, this morning to wrap up my talk. But uh, as Melissa was saying, the Federated Indians are comprised of descendants of the Coast Miwok and Southern Pomo people. At the time of pre-contact, there were more indigenous people in Marin, Sonoma, and Lake County than there was anywhere in the New World outside of the present site of Mexico City, which was the Aztec capital. There were more languages spoken in this area than anywhere outside the central Philippines. And you know, the ethnographers and anthropologists who always, as my great aunt always used to say in her mixed English, used to say, always tried to analyze us. Um, <laughs> she, um, they always wondered, how did so many people get along for thousands of years with virtually no physical warfare? They took care of the environment and all of that. Well, you know, we had a very, we had a very subtle culture. Um, essentially, uh, we believe that everything in nature had power and had the power to protect itself and take care of itself. So a rock, a, a, a bird, everything had songs, had spirit. And if you violated that spirit, it would come back on you. If I might be a good person but I, and have good songs, but if you violated me or did something wrong, you would immediately, something would happen to you the next day or to somebody in your family. Um, you know, it's, it, and so what, what that did is you were constantly reminded that you weren't the center of the universe, you were part of the universe. You were constantly decentered as a knower, always questioning, wondering, because you didn't know. And you know, um, again, the ethnographers always said, well, these California, Central California cultures were predicated on black magic uh, and fear and all these kinds of things. No, they were predicated on profound respect for every aspect of life and the ways in which everything was connected. You know, the Europeans, it's the Spanish when they came here, of course they had a great debate whether we were even worth, worth converting um, because they said we were so backward and so stupid um, that all we did is sit around and sing songs and weave baskets. Art and philosophy, what a way to go! Um, <laughs> You know, but um, uh, anyway, they didn't understand us. And we, all of us have a tendency to see other people in terms of ourselves. And the Europeans always thought that the Plains cultures were the most sophisticated because the Plains cultures manifested the things that the Europeans valued most, organized warfare, right? They, they had that. We were much more subtle. You just dropped dead the next day. And the Europeans didn't understand subtlety. They're still, they're still working on it. But, um, but in any event, basically it was a culture that at its root was a we culture. We with one another, we with everything that was here. And it was a culture that I want to call a home culture. We were home. We were safe. We were connected. When the Spanish came, first came, and then the Mexicans, all of a sudden, a new story came, a new culture. It was not a home culture, it was a homeless culture. Yeah. It was based on, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick a blame. My, my mother is Jewish, so I'm gonna blame the Jews for this one. <laughs> uh, but let's just pick a story. There's a group of people that were wandering, released from slavery, and they're wandering the desert 3,000 years ago, and they're told that they are owed a homeland and that they're chosen. That combination became very toxic because you became entitled and you were entitled to go somewhere and claim something. That culture kept getting replicated and replicated. Christians, Muhammad, we're all, they're all the best. One God, all that kind of thing. And everywhere that went spawned new nationalisms and an us-them culture. Wars, us, them, us, them, us, them. Even here among my own Indian people, 
a result of this. We had our own nationalism, our own kind of form here where in the latter part of the 19th century in Lake County there was the infanticide of mixed blood children. Anything associated with a white man was the devil. All of a sudden we're caught in the us them, the us them. How do we undo the homeless culture and come home where it's we again? We're all here. So how do we come home? How does this become once again a we culture? Well, of course, uh, continue with the history. The Spanish came, uh, put us in missions right here. Uh, then the Mexican period came in, the Californio period. I always like to make sure I tell my, my friends from Mexico, it wasn't you, it was another group of, of people from Mexico. Don't worry, you married us. Uh, you married my cousin. Um, but um, uh, when the Californio period came, that group of Californios, Vallejo and those folks, established one of the most elaborate slave trading systems that we've seen, where they took all the men, mostly the men and boys, and traded them as far away as Mexico from here, and kept us as slaves. Then, of course, the Bear Flag Revolution came, California became a state. The first piece of legislation that the state of California enacted was the Act for the Government and Protection of Indians, which legalized Indian slavery in the state of California. That law was not repealed until 1868, three years after the Civil War. So that here, Indian children were being sold and taken and raided and all of that. Then, after that law was repealed in 1868, we became, in fact, indentured servants on whosever land we were on, and hence you began to get the term rancherias around. And that went on uh, around. We were not citizens, as were other American Indians, until 1924. That meant a girl here, and we didn't have, especially in this area, the coast of Miwok, didn't have reservations or large groups of people. We had to hide the best we could. But remember, if you're not a citizen, you can be raped or tortured, and you have no recourse in the courts. We, that was a situation for those of us who were Indian people here until 1924. My grandmother was born in 1910. So again, it was a very difficult history. At the turn of the 20th century, early part of the 20th century, all of a sudden more people moving into California, more people moving into this rich area and so forth, they began to say, what are we going to do with these Indians? They're all there's groups of these homeless Indians. They didn't even call us by tribal name or anything like that. They called homeless Indians. So the federal government created um, the California Indian Rancherias for the so-called homeless Indians of California. And what they did is they created little group, put little groups of land, and they said all the homeless Indians go there. So in our case, for instance, the, and this is the actual legislation, for the homeless Indians of Tamales Bay, Bodega Bay, Sebastopol, and the vicinities thereof, will go to the Grayton Rancheria, 15.5 acres, and become a de facto tribe. Now, it could have been any American Indian who was in the area, homeless Indians, but it was de facto a tribe, became a designee for that rancheria. Okay, well, unfortunately, only three of those acres were inhabitable. Many of us went there, um, and many of us went there during the summer when we were picking the crops. I'm fast-forwarding here. In 1958, they decided to begin to give us the option to terminate these rancherias, to no longer have them, to have them in private ownership. That's an updated version of the Dawes Act, where the Indian people are uh, given the option of owning their land in private ownership. So they come in the summer, in August of 1958, and there's three older men on the reservation, uh, neither of, none of whom understand the law very well, and the rest of us are out harvesting pears, because that's what we were doing that time of year, and they said to these three older gentlemen, would you like to own your land? Well, to three older Indian guys, that sounds really good. So they said, sign here, and by signing there, unbeknownst these, these guys, these older men uh, in our tribe, we lost our sovereignty, we lost the tribe, we lost everything that we had as an Indian people, what little we did have. Um, now, the law said that that had to be done by consensus. The tribe had to agree if you were going to do this. Clearly, it wasn't done by consensus, but again, how many of us understood that, and how these men certainly didn't understand that. Um, so, we became, in fact, Home, unknown, non-white, homeless Indians once again. 
1992, when I was beginning my, uh, I was an assistant professor at UCLA, uh, a cousin of mine sent me a note that said something about a tribe that was recognized putting a casino down in Marshall in our territory, and I thought, oh my God, we don't have anything, and this tribe's gonna come in our area and do this kind of thing right on the only thing we do have, which was a half, between a half and a quarter acre cemetery down there. So uh, they said, Greg, what should we do? So the elders, we got together. I came up from UCLA. We had a meeting. And folks, that meeting was remarkable because families who'd been separated and not seen each other for 40 years because we had to go out and get jobs came together at that meeting with family albums. And after we decided we were going to start reorganizing, we sat down and ate together for the first time in many, many years, shared family albums and looked at each other's relatives, pictures of each other's relatives in those albums, and realized again, hey, we are a people. Let's start again. Let's see if we can go back, start again. For eight years, we fought, and finally, I uh, drafted language for a bill to get us restored. President Clinton signed that bill. Finally, uh, in December 2000, two weeks before he went out of office, and to date, we're the last tribe in the United States of America to be restored by an act of Congress. So, uh, <laughs> and I'm sure some of you heard that I'm a liar, and you've heard all the history. Greg said he wasn't going to; well, they weren't going to do gaming, and they weren't going to do this, and they weren't going to do that. Well, we weren't, and that's the truth. We wanted rights back. We wanted to be able to get a line on the federal budget. We wanted to take care of our people. Unfortunately, because we were the last tribe to be restored, we were unable to get a line on the federal budget. We had to keep applying for grants. I went back to UCLA and uh, wanted to write my books and teach and do those sort of things. And all of a sudden, people began to discuss the C word. Oh, yes. And I, I, read, the, I read the blogs. You're going to have that terrible person speak at Bioneers, Greg Sarris. He started a casino. He's awful. So here I am. Um, um, shoot me. So when we, when we began, when we got together as a tribe, we thought, OK, people, we got to this whole thing. The last thing I wanted to do is get involved in something like a casino. I mean, I'm a nerd. I write books. I read books. Um, so I thought, OK, can we do something that would benefit Indian and non-Indian alike? Could we do, is it possible, is it totally antithetical to somehow use this to create a home for all of us? Is it somehow possible to create that, the old ethics and aesthetics of place where we not only become keepers of the land, but are reminded that the land keeps us? Okay, is, is this possible? It seems strange. Well, I knew the folks, our tribe, our council wanted to go this direction. So um, basically, uh, I knew that we had a lucrative location, and I knew I'd have some power. So I pulled that power. I, all the casino operators were interested in talking to me, of course. And folks, it, the, it is strange world. I mean, they're, you know, these money guys, all the things you've heard are true. Um, so uh, anyway, they come. And given the location, I created a cockfight in my living room. And I had them all there. And I said, I want 100% control of the development board. I said, I want to build it and run it union so that the maids and everybody else have medical, <laughs> dental, and retirement. I said, I want to build it LEED certified. And I want $200 million up front that I don't have to pay back that we can give to our green organizations and the things that matter to us. Well, you know, I got it all. <laughs> but. But the interesting thing, I, you know, and I didn't know, know this, this is about greed. Guess what the thing that was nearly the deal breaker was? The unions. They did not want, the Vegas did not want anything to do with unions, but too bad, they got them now. And so um, uh, it was, began a long battle, and we, we went ahead, we began to give uh, Lots of land. We had 2,000 acres on 37 we were going to build. When we realized that that was an environmentally sensitive area on the bay, we not only gave up our right to that land, we gave our down payment $4.5 million on that and gave Sonoma County $75,000 to get a fundraiser to raise the rest of the money to purchase that for open space. <clears throat> We continued to give money to green organizations, work with Occidental Arts and Ecology Center, 
But we had a big, we really had a dream here. And as our, we say, there's a lot of a greatenisms, you might say. And one of them, we say, is this casino is not about a new color TV. This casino is not about a bigger car. It's about positioning ourselves to take care of the land and restore the land and buy back open space in Sonoma County so that once again, we will have a home for everybody and can feed everybody the right way. A big dream, a big dream. But that was our dream and is our dream. We proceeded along and kept moving, doing various things. There was a lot of opposition, a lot of bad things that were being said. We didn't want to get into it. And yes, we are building something and all of this. I found it a little ironic that there was so much attention and all the politicians, uh, uh, the local politicians were jumping on us and saying, oh, they're so terrible. And I kept thinking here, yes, we are building. Um, a facility that's going to be LEED certified and run a union, but I'm looking around Sonoma County and there's 70,000 acres of non-organic grapes and how come nobody's saying anything about that? <laughs> 70,000 acres of non-organic grapes that have lowered the water table 200 feet and are poisoning the workers and poisoning us. But oh boy, those Indians build a green casino and they're bad, bad, bad. Those Indians want to take care of us, and they're bad, bad, bad. We got to find somebody, have a pariah. Of course, it's not the first time for Indians. Um, you know, it's interesting. It's interesting. The, there's been two pre prevalent stereotypes of the American Indian. When we're defeated, you love us. We become the fallen nature god. Oh, isn't it sad? Let's, we love them to weave baskets and be in museums and, you know, weren't they into nature and wonderful? But the minute it becomes a question of power and territory, suddenly we're wagon burners again. <laughs> so when I was making movies and writing books, I was native son in Santa Rosa. When I come back and I'm leading this casino thing, all of a sudden I'm the devil. I'm, I'm not Indian, I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm, I'm, I want to make money. Folks, I have a job. Um, you know, uh, so it was, it was an ugly thing, but we said, take the high road, take the high road. Of course, as one of my cousins said, uh, Greg, I'm so tired of taking the high road, I've got a nosebleed. But, um, <laughs> so we moved ahead, and what, then each opportunity became an opportunity to do the right thing. And so this past June, we, fight with the, we got our land into trust. Diane Feinstein tried to stop us. We got our land into trust for the resort casino. And then came time for the compact. So I went to the Sacramento, and I thought, you know, the, all the tribes that have gaming, they have to give up roughly 15% back to the state. So I said to the governor, you know, you can't give money locally anymore, much money. Why don't, instead of that money, go to you why doesn't it come back to the local community? And it's a win-win for everybody. Now, now, of course, the tribe has to mitigate for the casino, the road, and traffic, or whatever that. And that, that is from the environmental study that we have to do. We do have to do that. But I said to the governor, why don't you let that big portion of money come back? But I also thought to myself, he said, yeah, that's a good idea, but I also thought, but I want the tribe to have control of that to say how it's used so that when it comes back, supervisors don't pay for pensions with it. So, you'll love this. It, we, that compact passed through Sacramento so quickly. Sadly, uh, the only people who voted against it are our local reps there. Um, yeah, your, your friend Jared Huffman and Noreen Evans, they voted against it. Um, but everybody else voted for it. Now, what happened after that? Today, uh, finally, we worked out an MOU. We had one with Rohnert Park. We would give them $9.7 million a year for low-income housing and other things like that. But what I'm really proud of, and it's public this morning, right now as I am standing here, it's just been published, we finished negotiating the MOU with Sonoma County. So Sonoma County will get $6.7 million a year for alcoholism, roads, all kinds of things associated with the casino. But then there's the community benefit fund that the tribe had uh, control over. 
and this is what you can go read. So for all those who say I'm a liar, you can go check on the, it's right published, I just checked with our tribal attorney this morning. $25 million a year from Great and Rancheria will go to, open, uh, to the parks and open space, land space, every year. In addition to that, the five million on top of that, now we're up to 30 million, five million on top of that will go to an environmental issue or issues jointly decided on by a panel comprised of 50% Great and Rancheria Tribal Council and 50% Sonoma County Supervisors. Six million on top of that will go to the two non-gaming tribes in Sonoma County. Each of those tribes will get three million dollars a year to take care of themselves and enhance their lives. They're in, they're in, they're in locations where they can't have casinos and frankly we have enough casinos. If the other tribes who are in lucrative locations making all this money would take care of other Indian people, we wouldn't have all these wars. The next 12 million will go back, oh wait, I forgot, 2 million to Sonoma County Indian Health then on top of that. So Sonoma County Indian Health Project that serves Indian people will get $2 million. 12 million then will go back to the state for the other non-gaming tribes in the state of California. And then anything above that will again come back to Sonoma County for environmental issues to be jointly decided on between the tribe and the, uh, and the Board of Supervisors. So in a sense, what we have done is position ourselves, and I forgot to tell you a really important thing. This is my big thing. We still have 320 acres north of 37, and we've given that, we're giving that to uh, Sonoma County Land Pass. But this is the caveat. With that part of that 25 million, we are immediately beginning to uh, establish and, and create an organic farm on those 320 farm acres there to grow vegetables. Uh, we will oversee it. It will be farmed by low-risk prisoners and undocumented folks, my best friends. And the vegetables that we grow will be sold in low-income neighborhoods at cost so that the Latinos and others in those low-income neighborhoods can be able to get the kinds of vegetables that the rest of us uh, buy at Whole Foods or other places. So again, uh, that's something I'm, I'm very proud of and that we're gonna go. So at the end of the day, we have finally, and it, it's a historic moment for me, and I'm so glad to be sharing it with folks like you and with my tribal council. I want folks from my tribe and my council to stand up. It's not just me, you voted, it's your idea. Please stand up. Um, so again, we positioned ourselves to do this. By the way, with the parks, we will be instrumental in all decisions with that 25 million. We will be helping them design the parks just as we have with the Tole Lake project right up here. Um, and again, you know, finally, we, it's a, it's a thing. One of, somebody said to me, well, you know, why a casino? Why, why, why don't you just, how, I said, how are you gonna buy back that open space unless you have money? What are you gonna do with this kind of thing? And the, the, my, this friend, this reporter said to me, well, you know, I'm just gonna stand in front of the tractors when there's development. And I said, you know, we tried that in the 60s. Two things happen, you get run over, you get arrested. <laughs> so there's gotta be a way where you can take money and I'm hoping that other organizations, tribes and other businesses will follow this model to take care of their local communities to take care of themselves. And in closing, when I began this revenue share 
with the counties and everything, some of the leaders from Southern California, those wealthy tribes, called me up and say, Greg, you know what your problem is? You're half white. You don't understand. We don't owe the white man anything. And I said, yes, we do. And they said, what? And I said, a good example. And this morning, I think we've delivered it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. 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 Thank you.